have an email here from Jim, and here's what Jim writes. It was not quite daylight on an early summer morning in the mouth of the ch- oh, I'm never going to pronounce this right. It's Coquahalla Co- 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 and Fraser Rivers in Hope, British Columbia. The tributary was taking on water because the Fraser was high and the salmon were running. The river had quite a few dying salmon that were spawning. I was there to take pictures of the wildlife, so I pulled out my small director's chair and sat quietly at the mouth. You have a director's chair? I want a director's chair. How do you get one of those? Across the river was a game trail where I have seen mule deer, whitetail, coyotes, and even the odd bobcat in the past, and I was sure I'd have luck that day. The sun was just beginning to creep over Mount Ogle... Ogilvy, Ogilvy, when two coyotes 75 yards away from me began yipping. It's not unusual to hear coyotes up there, but they sounded frantic, like dogs when a stranger has come into your yard. Curious, I looked over in the direction where they were yipping. Squatting down in the long grass at the water's edge another 50 yards beyond them was a huge figure. At first, I thought it was a bear. Then it turned its attention on me, and it stood up on two legs. A cold chill shot up my spine as the hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and I was frozen in shock, staring at a massive male Sasquatch. Behind him were some alder saplings that were roughly eight feet high. They came up to his chest, and he was covered in dirty blonde-colored hair, and he had a dome-shaped head and a very human-looking face. His nose was a bit wider than a man's, and it looked like he didn't have a neck. We stared at each other for a good 20 seconds before he let out an unbelievably loud scream that was strangely high pitched for something that large. I'll never forget the look of disgust he gave me before he did something totally unexpected. He began talking, for lack of a better word, in some sort of gibberish that was a mix of high and low tones. And then he grunted and raised his hand and flung it at me as if to say, leave me alone. I noticed he had a salmon in his other hand. His annoyance with me and his hand gestures were so human that I relaxed a little bit. He turned and started walking away. And from behind, I could see that he was wide in the shoulders and he was lean in the waist. I guessed him to be 1,100 pounds. I've seen big bears and he dwarfed them. His strides were six feet each, and every step as he casually walked away from me, he'd turn and look back over his shoulder. It reminded me so much of the Patterson-Gimlin film. He looked just like Patty, but without the breasts. He looked back at me one last time, and he stopped and flung his hand at me in annoyance again, and then he stepped into the bush. Clearly, he was angry that I interrupted his meal, and he scolded me for it but I was in awe throughout the whole experience. That is a great story. That's like a recreation of Patty, but closer. It's like closer. He's sitting in his director's chair. At Y'all, I know what a director's chair is. I just thought it was kind of funny. Like he was sitting down about to direct a film, but they sell director's chairs at Sam's, and I actually almost bought one one day because they have a little table on them. I thought that'd be a good place to put my drink and whatever else I'm carrying at the time. Anyway, this is a great story, and I really appreciate Jim for sending it. Uh, He's a good writer, and it's great. It's really great. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. My name's Cameron Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid What If It's True podcast. Got several stories in this video. Hope you guys enjoy them. If for any reason anyone is dissatisfied when it's over, if you'll just leave a comment below, I'll refund your money in full. That's right. This is the podcast where if you're not totally happy when it's over, we'll give you your money back. All right, let's get into these stories. Hope you enjoy them. All right, here we go. This email is from someone who doesn't even give their name, but it's a real good story. So I may not know who they are, but I know it's a good story. And here we go. I used to stay with my pawpaw in the mountains of Virginia every year when school let out for summer break. 
We like to sit out on the porch at night and enjoy the cool of the evening and talk. On one of those nights, our conversation turned to hunting and trapping. We'd been talking for a bit when Pawpaw paused for a few minutes, during which he must have been pondering whether or not to tell me something that happened to him when he was my age. I was 16 at the time. He said he wanted to go out on his own and hunt and trap and sell pelts. Times were different back then. It wasn't nothing for a young guy of that age to go off and do his own thing. There was an old one-room cabin way up in the mountains far away from anyone that his dad used as sort of a hunting lodge when he was younger. That's where Papa decided to go and try his hand at being an independent man. He spent several months in that cabin collecting a variety of pelts, but the winter was hard and living off the land wasn't as easy as he hoped. He spent all of one day hunting and got nothing. And that night, as he slept, a storm blew in, dropping two feet of snow on the mountain. That made things all the more difficult, and Papa still had to eat. So he set out to hunt some game to sustain him until conditions were right and he could make his way off the mountain. He saw a deer and he took a shot. About the same time he pulled the trigger, something spooked it, and it took off running. Papa said that he'd hit the deer in its hind leg and he set out to track the blood trail through the snow, but it was getting late in the day. Darkness covered the mountain, and he had to give up. He was disappointed, and he made his way back to the cabin, and he built a fire and made some coffee and tried to stem the hunger with some hard tack. Next to the warm fire with a little food in his belly and exhausted, he fell asleep. Sometime in the night, he awoke to a strange, deep, guttural sound, and he heard voices. Rocks and sticks were being thrown at the cabin. He was scared now, and he stoked the fire, and he lit a lantern, and he hunkered down in the corner with his gun, waiting for the worst. It didn't last long, though, and once things had quieted down, he drifted off to sleep again. A few hours later, he woke up with a start. He was confused and angry with himself for having fallen asleep in such a situation as this. His cabin had no windows, but he could see sunlight coming around the door. It was morning. Papa opened the door slowly and peeked outside. He was still a little concerned. When he didn't see anything, he stepped outside to find footprints in the snow all around the cabin. They were giant human tracks, he called them. Judging by the size and the number of tracks, he guessed there must have been two or three individuals. He went around to the side of the cabin to grab some firewood before going back inside, and there, laying on top of the wood, was a hind leg of a deer. It had a single bullet hole right where Papa had shot it. Whatever those things were that scared him half to death the night before had tracked the deer that he had shot and took their share for tracking it, and then they gifted Papa the hind leg. He was grateful for the meat, but as soon as he was able, Papa made his way down off the mountain, never having seen what kind of boogers could make those tracks or rip the hind leg of a deer off. And that's the end of the story. Oh, that's cool. That's kind of a nostalgic story. And is it possible these things gift back to humans? I don't know. Apparently in this story they do. Uh, It's like he killed a deer for them. They got a little bit of it and they shared it with him. That's a pretty fair deal. If that happened, this is a really, really, really interesting event in my view. But I appreciate the writer, even though I don't know his name. It was a great story. Thank you, sir. Uh, The woman who wrote this email doesn't say whether to use her name or not, so I won't. We were living in the country north of Warsaw, Indiana in 2012. I was 14 at the time and enjoying life as only a teenager can. We lived in one of those small residential neighborhoods pocketed in the woods with our house sitting closest to the tree line. Those woods were our retreat as kids. I would head off there with my siblings and friends or all by myself and explore and play or just to relax and think. It was quiet there and we all spent a lot of time in those woods during the day, but we never did at night. That summer, I was sleeping in the back bedroom with the window open to catch a breeze, and something walked past my window. 
I didn't see it, but I could tell by the sound of its walk that it was massive. I would have thought it was a bear, but we don't have those in Indiana. And it scared me so bad that I ran and got my father. He took his gun and went outside, but he didn't find anything. A few months later, my sister and I were sleeping in that same bedroom. Like typical teenagers, we were talking when we should have been sleeping. At 2 a.m., suddenly we heard some exotic bird calling. We figured it must have been some exotic bird. We spent most of our free time in the woods and we knew all the bird sounds in our area and we could not identify this one. It became a regular occurrence after that. Sometimes it was just one bird calling and other times we'd hear one call and another answer back from the opposite direction. It was always close to the house and it was always loud. I remember asking my sister, have you ever heard a bird like that? She said she hadn't. We knew it wasn't an owl, and we didn't know of any other night birds in our area. None that can make a call that loud anyway. I've never heard birds chirping or calling that late at night as well. And this sound, well, it was off. Didn't sound right. This went on for several months, and and then it just stopped. Two years later, I had switched to the bedroom next to that one. My sister and I were sharing it. We liked to leave the windows open at night so we could hear the sounds of crickets and frogs. And the cool air felt nice. We'd close the curtains for privacy, but that didn't stop the breeze. It was summertime again, and that meant we were taking advantage of our freedom from school by sitting up and talking all night. We'd also sneak out to meet friends or they would sneak up to our window to visit us. That was another reason we liked to leave the windows open. We shared a bunk that was placed right next to the window, and I slept on the bottom so I was better able to see outside. That window faced a dead-end road that we lived on, where a dimly lit street lamp barely lit up the yard. It cast a low glow on the window. My sister and I had stayed up talking as usual, but around 1 a.m. she drifted off, so I was lying there looking out at the night. Out of nowhere, I began to hear something walking around the side of the house from the woods. My first thought was that it was some random person cutting through our yard. Or maybe it was an annoying raccoon that had been getting into our trash. But the sound of the footsteps were distinct and heavy. It walked up to my window and it stopped right in front. Backlit by the street light, its shadow fell across the curtains. Whatever was out there, it was huge. It had the outline of a very tall man. Unfortunately, shadows are never more detailed than that. I didn't feel like it would hurt me, but I did feel the need to lie very still and be quiet. It was as if it were listening for my breathing or my movements. I was too afraid to look out the window. I didn't want to see what was out there. I couldn't bring myself to go get my dad because I couldn't leave my sister alone in the room and nothing but a scream between her and that thing. I never heard it breathe or move. It stood there staring at the window for a minute or two and then it moved away, back toward the woods. It took me a few minutes to get up the courage to close my window. I'd have to open the curtain to do so and I was afraid of what I might see. I replay that night over and over in my head all the time, and each time I hear myself asking the same question again and again, what just happened? That was the last strange occurrence I had at that house before we moved. I never actually saw anything, but after some experiences in Tennessee and an experience my cousin had in northern Idaho, I'm a true believer in monsters. Uh, Well, you said you didn't see anything, but you saw the outline of it. It was backlit by the street, the dim street lamp. You saw something. It was big and it was standing in front of your window. And I would count that as a visual encounter. This is great. Uh, Summer nights, you hear something walking around the outside of the house. You know no one is supposed to be out there. And then uh, a year later, the next summer, you open your window and there's something standing right there silhouetted against the streetlight. Unreal. Great story. Thank you, ma'am, for sending it. I like this story 
Not because it's extra exciting, but because the woman who wrote it is just happy. She's just a happy person. I can tell, sometimes you can tell by the way people write. They're just good-natured, happy, fun-loving people, probably very kind and nice. But this story has an interesting twist to it. Maybe not a twist, but it's an interesting subject. So let's jump into it. The writer's name is, uh, let's see her, Brittany. She tells me at the end of the email, it's okay to use her name. In the late summer of 2014, my husband and I were enjoying a relaxing afternoon in our apartment watching TV. It was rare that our days off coincided, so we were content just being on the same sofa together. I got up to retrieve something from the kitchen, but when I walked back into the living room, I witnessed something that I will never forget and I couldn't make up even if I wanted to. Six or seven feet away from the sofa and four feet off the ground, a glowing orb appeared out of thin air right in front of me. I blinked several times, thinking it was dust on my contact lens or something in my head, but it remained. It was smaller than a cantaloupe, but bigger than a grapefruit, maybe six or seven inches in diameter, and it had the most unusual but beautiful soft bluish-purple luminescence to it. It was semi-transparent and appeared to be hollow in the center. It reminded me of a giant soap bubble, but the nearest bathroom was around the corner and down the hall, much too far for a bubble that size to travel without popping. I remember how puzzled I was trying to figure out how it was being illuminated. Was it lit from the inside? No. From one of my lamps? No again. It was late in the afternoon and the only light source was our open window. This sounds strange, but it seemed like the surface or the skin of this orb was radiating its own light. All of a sudden I felt very calm and for some reason I knew that it was benign. It hung in the air, barely moving, as I stood in place and watched it. I wanted to get my husband's attention, who was glued to the TV, and I wanted to say something, but I was fixated and under the spell of whatever this was. I was in awe, and I didn't care to speak or look away or even move. Even though I had the urge to reach out and touch it, I was worried it would disappear at the slightest disturbance. Mentally, I was begging my husband to look over in my direction to concur with what I was seeing, if not also have the chance to see something truly awesome, but to no avail. Within ten seconds, the orb vanished into thin air, just as quickly and randomly as it had appeared. It didn't pop or implode, it simply disappeared like someone turning off a light switch. My feet were glued to the floor, and I turned at the hip toward my oblivious husband. Please tell me you saw that, I said excitedly. He finally looked up and gave me a look that read, Huh? The, the, that orb thing, you didn't see it, I said. I stammered and almost irritated with him for not noticing. He looked at me like I was crazy until he read the expression on my face. Baby, what did you see? He asked, half suspicious and half concerned. I told him everything I just relayed to you, and he went through the same rational checklist I had. Was it a soap bubble? Was it just the light? No, no, no were the answers to all the sane and reasonable possibilities he offered. My husband knows that I am an eccentric person, but an honest one too, and I firmly believe in karma, so he believed me, and he still does. However, neither of us can accurately or definitively identify what I saw. This experience heightened my fascination and jump-started my study of this anomaly, and I have come to find that people all over the world have seen these orbs for centuries. Accounts vary, as do the descriptions. They can be any size, any color, and some are even mobile and recurring. Another interesting point is that most of these sightings take place in energetically charged locations where other supernatural sightings have occurred. There are hundreds of photos of these online, but much like any paranormal or supernatural phenomenon, 
It's hard to obtain scientific and physical proof, so we have to rely on first-hand accounts like this. I don't mind if you use my name or not because I have nothing to lose or gain by telling my story. It was just a really amazing but true event that happened to this witness. I still have no idea what these orbs are or where they come from or what they mean. Either way, it was a beautiful materialization of energy and I feel privileged to have seen it. Recalling this story makes me smile and reminds me that we don't know what we don't know about this world, but it is a truly a wondrous place nonetheless, and it deserves the same respect and care that we all do. I hope something random and awesome happens to you today. She's talking to me and the people listening. Thank you for your time and your wonderfully eye-opening channel. Okay, she's going to talk about all that. Uh, what I thought was the, the reason I pulled this story up and read it was because Brittany said, I hope something random and awesome happens for you today. Now, people who are sad and ugly and mean and grouchy and curmudgeon don't say things like that. So I can tell this woman is a very happy person and she looks at things. Uh, I can kind of identify with what she's saying. I've seen things in my life. And I just look at them in wonder. I, I'm just, I look at things in awe that are strange like this. And I think to myself, how lucky I was to get to have seen that. I've talked about a few of those things in some of my podcasts and none of them are spectacular, but even the slightest unusual, beautiful light, or uh, it could even be a sunset or a group of geese lighting in a field or being buzzed by 20 wood ducks right at the end of the day when they're coming in to roost, or watching a big bass bust the water. I could go on and on and on. The last six days, as I ride through the woods with my dogs, I have seen deer up close five out of six days. I didn't see them today, uh, but the previous five days, it's like I almost know they're there and I know where to look and they're, I sit up close. Some of them are pretty far away and they're in the woods and you can barely see them and you don't see them until they move or twitch their tail or whatever. They have to move for you to see them or you will not see them. But uh, I, I don't know, there's something going on right now and I'll be riding down a lane or through one of these old logging roads and something will tell me to look to the left and Maybe it's God. Maybe he knows I like looking at wildlife and he's just saying, look to your left. There's a couple of my deer over there. Take a peek. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the same way this woman is. I look at everything. Uh, I don't know with young eyes. I'm 60 years old. I'm getting older, but I try and I think I look at everything with young eyes. So maybe that's a good motto for, for today or something to tell yourself throughout the week is just say, I want to look at things with young eyes like a kid. And when you see something, just look at it. If it's a puppy, if it's a dog, if it's a child, if it's your wife, it's whatever. Look at those things like a child and have those childlike experiences. Oh man, I'm getting kind of mushy here. I'm going to quit talking about that. But Brittany, thank you very much for the story. And thanks for the good vibes on this whole thing. I really appreciate you. The author's name is Doug. The category of this encounter is a time slip. He claims the story is true. It's a secondhand story told to him by a friend. In 2009, we were driving from our home in Houston, Texas, up to a football training camp for our nine-year-old son. The camp was located in Austin, normally a two to three hour drive west. The traffic on Interstate 10 was light and we were making good time, so we decided to exit at the next small town to look for a place to have lunch. My son spotted a Whataburger restaurant, so we pulled into the parking lot. We couldn't help but notice all of the old 1940s and 1950s vintage cars and trucks. My husband said there must be a car show nearby or maybe a weekend cruise. We walked inside and approached the counter. Right away, I noticed the girl who took our order was wearing clothing and sporting hair and makeup right out of the 40s or the 50s. 
She was also very polite, maybe even a little too polite. Her manners and vernacular seemed strange and out of place. Once we placed our order, we found a booth and sat down. My husband pointed out that all the employees seemed odd, like something wasn't right, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. We all turned our attention to the counter and kitchen area to study them more closely. The men weren't wearing polo-style shirts like we were used to. Their shirts were more of a polyester type in colors that were old school, so to speak. Both of the women were wearing dresses, definitely not the usual top and pants uniform they wear in the big city. As my husband and I discussed the attire of the staff, my son interrupted us to point out that we were the only customers in the dining room. That was odd, considering the two dozen or more vehicles in the parking lot, and that they were the only business on that block. Our name was called over the speaker, and my husband walked over to get our food. Where is everyone? He asked the woman behind the counter as he pointed to all the cars and trucks out front. She looked at him and then out the window and then back at him as if she didn't understand what he meant. Nothing more was said. He brought the food back to the table. We asked for blessings on our meal and we ate. Once we'd finished, I checked my watch and I said, we best be on our way. And we thanked them for lunch and went out to our car. My husband looked around at all the vehicles and pointed out that they were all empty and there was no one around. We left the restaurant and headed back down the two-lane road towards I-10. We approached a four-way stop sign and came to a stop. No other vehicles were in sight, so I began to pull forward through the intersection. Suddenly, I spotted a flash of turquoise to my right. Out of nowhere, an old vintage pickup truck was barreling towards us. It all happened so fast, he was going to hit us. And my husband tucked his head in his hands and then between his knees. At the same time, my son shouted, He's not going to stop! I knew we were not going to make it across the road and there wasn't enough room for the truck to get by us. So I gritted my teeth and braced for impact, closed my eyes, waiting for the collision. A moment later, we opened our eyes and looked around. We had, in fact, made it across the intersection without colliding with the truck. But how? My husband looked down the road and saw that the truck was already nearly a half a mile away. Had it gone right through us? What just happened? he asked in astonishment. We just sat there looking around, unable to find any answers or justify the situation. My son finally said, we better get going or we might be late. That's enough for one day, I said, looking up to heaven. My husband agreed and suggested our angels must have been looking out for us. We made it to my son's camp with a few minutes to spare. Once we got him enrolled, my husband and I hung out in the gym for a while, contemplating all the strangeness of the day. So have you figured out what happened back there, he asked. No, even that burger joint was weird, I answered. He offered a pensive, yeah. The next morning, we said goodbye to our son and wished him well before heading back to Houston. On our way home, we decided to stop at that Whataburger to see if we'd lost our minds or something. We drove up and down that stretch of road several times, but the Whataburger wasn't there. There were a few farmhouses for about a mile, but not a business in sight, let alone a burger place. The intersection was there, and we double-checked to make sure we went the same direction this time, and we had. It was like something out of the Twilight Zone. On our return trip to Austin, we didn't even bother to take that exit again. My son asked about it when we passed it on our way back home, but we couldn't bring ourselves to tell him the restaurant wasn't there. We just said that we still hadn't figured out what happened at that intersection. All right, here's an email I got from Bill, and it's, it's pretty short. And in one way, it's really serious and scary, but in another way, it's hysterical. It really is funny. Uh, so you can, you can look at it in any way you want, but I'm going to share it with you. And thank you, Bill, for sending this. 
In September or October of 1970, my battalion had been called up for deployment to Vietnam. In preparation, we were doing some intensive training in the heavily forested areas of Fort Jackson. The night was so dark underneath the canopy of old-growth trees that we could barely see our faces. I was on the left side of the main body, and orders came down for my six-man squad to move ahead of the main body and scout for aggressors and booby traps. In the darkness, we had to rely on our first-generation night scopes to get our bearings. We had moved ahead 300 yards of the main body when I spotted a really large tree. I moved to it and got into a prone position, and from there I could use my night scope to scan ahead. I laid there for five minutes scanning the area, but I didn't see anything, so I decided to get up. I placed my left hand down to push myself up, and all hell broke loose. I had put my hand on a booger's toe. He screamed and roared so loud that my ears rang for ten minutes. And I stumbled backward and I screamed, Retreat! And I began firing my M16 in all directions. Thank God they were all blanks. I was heading backwards as my company was charging toward me, and the booger took off crashing through the woods like a T-Rex, leaving a path of destruction in his retreat. Twenty minutes later, four black Suburbans pulled up, and some guys dressed in black fatigues got out and they took over. They took me to the medical tent where I was examined and then grilled about what happened. They told me never to tell anyone about what I saw. There would be a penalty of a court-martial. While I was in the tent, the others were taking measurements, looking for hair, casting tracks, and who knows what else. I saw six heavily armed men head off tracking the big fella, but I doubted they would find him. Later, my platoon sergeant told me that it had measured 8 foot 11 and it weighed a 1,000 pounds. All in all, I don't think he was there to hurt anybody. I think he was just curious about what we were doing. So that, that's a story. You can tell that's scary. Yeah, that's scary in one way. I know this guy was like, I mean, when, when a trained soldier or Marine or somebody who's got combat experience just jumps up and starts firing their weapon in all directions, uh, they're either real jumpy and green, in other words, not trained really well, which I think this guy was trained really well, or they're startled so much and they anticipate some type of impending doom that they just start shooting out of desperation, and it looks like that's what this guy did. Now, I'm not an expert on these things, and who knows? Who knows why? But in another way, you can look at it as kind of a funny thing. I mean, if you could kind of step back and look at it like you're watching a movie, that'd be kind of funny. But at either rate, Bill, thank you for the story. It's really good. I like the way you put it together, and I don't know if you meant it to be funny, but it was great. It was really great. Thanks. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. Maybe you can give me a thumbs up or even subscribe and hit the notification bell. I would appreciate that. And until the next one, hope you guys have a good week. We'll see you then. All right. Thanks. Thanks.